All right, welcome to this lecture uh, talking about acceleration of a fluid particle. We're continuing on with our discussion of differential uh, fluid elements. So we, in the previous lecture, we talked about conservation of mass for a small piece of fluid, and that was called the continuity equation. We're going to get into writing the linear momentum equations for a little piece of fluid. Since the linear momentum equations involve acceleration, it's kind of like Newton's second law, right? So F equals MA. I want to focus in this lecture on the acceleration part. Okay, so the purpose of this is just like with the continuity equation, it's one of our equations of motion for fluid movement at a small scale. The, not, the linear momentum equations, or Newton's second law, are the other equations of motion that we use for fluid particles at a small scale. We combine these together and usually solve those equations either in some very limited cases by hand or more commonly using numerical methods like CFD. And if you look at your screen, you actually see another uh, kind of pretty picture of a computational fluid dynamics simulation, a flow around a race car. And there are some colors here that I'm presuming are, have to do with the pressure. Uh, you know, so the colors actually like on the wheel and um, various parts of the race car probably are calculations of pressure on those surfaces. You can see some uh, velocity appear to be velocity vectors. So these are very likely to be streamlines at this instant in time uh, around, the, around the vehicle. So it gives you some insight as to how that vehicle is going to perform. You know, at speed, you can get a feel for what kind of drag component you're going to have, what kind of uh, force is pressing the vehicle into the ground, things like that. And so from these kinds of pictures, you can make those predictions and you can see, you know, if you change the design, how that's going to affect your, your performance. And it's better to do this computationally, even though the computations may take a long period of time. Uh, these computations are complex, so they take a long time to run. But it's better to do it computationally than to go out there and actually try to build it and then test it and then you know scrap that, build another thing and test it. That's pretty costly to do it that way. So it's, it's good to get some insight computationally first and then go out and test a a much smaller number of vehicles to see you know how they perform. So let's go ahead and talk about acceleration of a fluid particle. So the idea is this if we have I'm gonna I'm gonna motivate this with kind of a something that's not related to the acceleration. Okay I'm gonna I'm gonna motivate it with something involving the temperature. Let's say I wanted to measure the temperature uh, in this room okay or in the room that you're in. And so let's say I have a little um, little thermometer. It's a very small thermometer. And I can move it around in the room. Now, the room has a certain temperature field, right? So the temperature field I show in the, the, on the screen here looks like this. So its temperature could be a function of time. And, of course, it could also be a function of position, right? If I have my little thermometer, if I hold it in one place, Maybe the temperature in the room changes over the period of a day. At night, it gets a little colder. During the day, it gets a little warmer, right? It's, it's cycling, so it could be unsteady. It could be changing with time. And I could take my little thermometer and move it around. If I move it close to an air vent, it might get a little colder. If I move it further away, it might get a little warmer, right? So they could vary also because of changes in position. So my temperature could be a function of both time and position. Right? So there are two parts that can play a role to the, to the temperature that I read. Now imagine our little thermometer moves with a fluid particle. So it's always kind of moving around. It's sitting on a fluid particle. And it will experience those changes in temperature because of, again, changes in time. And then the fluid particle is moving around. So it's, it's seeing changes in position. Now the position of the fluid particle changes with time as well. Right? It's, it's related to the velocity. Right? If the fluid particle has some velocity, it changes position with time. So the positions, the x, y, z positions, are really functions of time. So we can write that down here, like x, let me, let me rewrite this. So x, y, and z are really functions of time as well. Right? And I've, I've tried to indicate that over here, that temperature is really a function of time and position, but position's a function of time as well. And I tried to illustrate this in this little cartoon on your screen here. Here's a little piece of fluid at some initial time, here's its position at that time, and then at some later time, you know, it's, it's moved around, right? Well, if I want to see how the temperature for that fluid particle changes as a function of time, 
I need to take the derivative with respect to time. So I need to take the derivative with respect to time here, and then also take the derivative with respect to position, but ten, then take this the the position and see its derivative with respect to time. That's the chain rule. You have to remember back to calculus about the chain rule. So that's what this, I'm going to zoom in on this here. That's what this expression is. Here is the time rate of change of the temperature as we follow a fluid particle. So we're following as a system or a fluid particle. Here's the time derivative of that temperature. That takes into account the T. And then here's the chain rule part. Here's the time rate, or here's the, the change in temperature with respect to the x position. So it's like dt dx. But x changes with t, so I do that time, I do that time derivative. Here's the change in the temperature due to the change in position y. And here's that dy dt. And here's dt dz and then dz dt. So this part is the chain rule. But if you look at that, dx dt is the x velocity. dy dt is the y velocity. dz dt is the, the z velocity. So in the end, my time derivative looks like this. And what I've done here, you'll notice I've changed my notation to use the capital D dt notation. Now, if you recall back, uh, if you watched the video related to the Reynolds transport theorem, all this is is a notational device. So to indicate that this is a time derivative as we sit on a little piece of fluid, we use a capital D dt. It's kind of like the difference between an ordinary derivative and a partial derivative. It's just a mathematical indicator that if you use a partial derivative, that means that quantity is a function of more than one variable. Ordinary derivative means it's a function of one variable. The capital D dt is the time derivative as you follow the fluid particle, meaning that its position is a function of time. Okay, so that's what that capital D dt, uh, oops, uh, notation is. It's just to indicate that we're following a fluid particle. Okay. We call that capital D dt derivative um, different names. It can be called uh, a Lagrangian derivative. Or it's sometimes called a material derivative. Sometimes it's called a substantial derivative. Or sometimes you'll see it called a total derivative. I'll most commonly call it the Lagrangian derivative. Okay. The term Lagrangian has to do with the fact that we're following a system. Our system here is a little piece of fluid. Remember, in a previous lecture, we talked about Eulerian and Lagrangian points of view. Uh, if you looked at that Reynolds transport theorem video, I talk about it there. An Eulerian point of view would be to look at a particular location and see how things change at that location, whereas a Lagrangian point of view is what you do is you follow a piece of you follow a system or like a piece of fluid and see how things change as you follow that piece of fluid. That's the Lagrangian perspective. Hence, we call this the Lagrangian derivative because we're following a particular piece of fluid. So what I've done here in this line is just, I've rewritten this, but just use the ux, ui, and uz here. So that's our Lagrangian derivative of the temperature. This is how the temperature would change for a little piece of fluid as it's moving around from place to place. So you see that it changes because there could be changes in time. You know, if the, if the movement of that particle is really slow, we can see the, the temperature variation from night and day, right? It gets colder at night, warmer during the day. So we see that temperature variation. And we also see the temperature variation as we change position. That's what this part is. We give these different names. This is called the Eulerian derivative or local time derivative because we're watching a it's the time variation in a particular location and then this part is called the convective derivative and that's the derivative because we're changing position it's due to, to changes in location so we can get changes in time that's the Eulerian part and changes in position that's the convective part and you add them both together and you get the Lagrangian derivative. And this one's specifically for temperature. We can write this a little more compactly by using um, kind of a, a, this kind of dot product notation. So what we're doing here is taking the gradient of the temperature, so that gives me the dt dx, dt dy, dt dz, 
makes it a vector, and then we dot product it with the velocity. And then that gives me the ux, uh, dt dx, plus so on and so forth. So it's just a little more compact way of writing it. Now I've done this specifically for temperature, but we can do it for any quantity. We could do it for pressure. We could see how the pressure varies for a little piece of fluid as it moves around. Because the pressure could be changing overall with time, and the pressure from point to point may be you know, changing due, due to pressure variations in, with uh, location. We could do temperature, pressure, density, whatever you want. Uh, we could also do the velocity of a piece of fluid. The velocity of a piece of fluid may be changing because there's changes in time, and it could be changing the velocity because of changes in position. So when we take the Lagrangian derivative of the velocity, that's the acceleration of a fluid particle as we follow that fluid particle. So that's where we're headed. Okay, so this uh, box is just a summary of what I've said. You know, the left-hand side is the Lagrangian rate of change or the Lagrangian derivative. The dot, dot, dot means of any quantity, temperature, pressure, velocity, you know, for example. And then here's our Eulerian or local rate of change. And then this is our convective rate of change. And then if you expand out the right-hand side, this is what it looks like. Again, the dot, dot, dot would be any quantity that you're interested in there. So if we're interested in acceleration, that's what this is. This is acceleration of a fluid particle as we follow it. So as we're following that fluid particle, this is its acceleration. We've got the Eulerian part in the convective part, and if you expand that out, it looks like this. This is a vector, right? The DDT term here, this is a vector. We've got a vector here, vector here, vector here. So that's this is an acceleration um, vector kind of quantity. Now, the reason we're particularly interested in this uh, acceleration is because now it sets us up to be able to calculate Newton's second law for a little piece of fluid. So one way we can write that out, and we call these, by the way, the, the, when we apply Newton's second law to a little piece of fluid, we call that the momentum equation, and you'll see that in the next lecture. But that equation will look like F equals MA, right? The mass of a little piece of, uh, a little piece of fluid always stays the same. If, it's the, if we're taking a system perspective, it's always the same mass. So we'll have Newton's second law is F equals MA. The acceleration is what you have right here on your screen. It's this, it's this term. That's the acceleration of our fluid particle. The mass is just the mass. And then the sum of the forces, well, we'll have to deal with that in a separate lecture, but that those are gonna involve pressure and viscous forces. And when we combine that all together, those will be the momentum equations for a little piece of fluid. All right, we'll go ahead and end it there.